Good afternoon and welcome everyone joining us for today's webinar on understanding the nexus between corruption and environmental crime. This is the first in a series of webinars jointly organized by the Wildlife Justice Commission and the International Anti-Corruption Academy. We are also uh, happy to welcome today speakers from the UNODC and the Fisheries Transparency Initiative. Uh, we are proud to have both these speakers with us as IACA has been partnering with both FITI and UNODC on various occasions in webinars and trainings. Before we start, I will just give the floor quickly to my colleague Marie Zonenstuhl to present IACA in uh, two quick minutes. Marie, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm happy to see such great interest in our webinar today and I wanted to give you a quick overview about our programs and our students. Our students at Ayakar are leading professionals coming from all over the world and from branches ranging from professionals and uh, public and private entrepreneurs. As corruption knows no borders and affects all countries and sectors of society, we believe that our holistic approach towards corruption equips our students to tackle this devastating issue. Currently, we are offering three master programs and a number of professional online courses, each specifically tailored to meet the expectations from applicants from all over the world and fields. Our first master is the Master in Anti-Corruption Studies, and it is our flagship program. It equips our students and enhances their knowledge concerning corruption from an academic perspective and on state level. Our second master program is the International Master in Anti-Corruption Compliance and Collective Action. This program offers a slight change of the perspective as our students also gain insight into the process of corruption. However, also the important objective of the course is compliance systems and collective action schemes, offering more of a practical know-how. Our third master program, which we are very happy about, is in collaboration with the United Nations Institute for Training and Research, also called UNITAR, and it covers, as the name already says, the main fields of anti-corruption and diplomacy. At the moment, we are still accepting applications for all three master programs, and also are very happy to announce that uh, we still have partial scholarships available for our master in anti-corruption and diplomacy. Just for, for you, for a quick uh, overview, that all our degrees are taught online and uh, part-time programs for highly motivated students who want to raise their knowledge and skills to perform their duties within a national and private organizations. If you have any questions related and regarding our master programs, please feel free to visit our website or write us an email to studies at ayaka.int. So this was the short break from my side and I'm happy to hand over to you, Tatiana. Thank you very much, Marie. This was just a quick overview of our master programs. We also offer short-term trainings uh, and other type of activities. Uh, you can find all the details, of course, on our website. I will briefly introduce the, uh, our partners in this um, webinar. The Wildlife Justice Commission is an international foundation set up in 2015 and with headquarters in The Hague, the Netherlands. The organization operates globally with a mission to disrupt and help dismantle organized transnational crimes network, criminal networks, trading in wildlife, timber and fish. The WJC collects evidence with an aim of turning it into accountability. They undertake investigations with a goal of presenting evidence of wildlife crimes to national governments and law enforcement agencies for action. Its goal is to encourage and support law enforcement action in arresting and successfully prosecuting high level traffickers as well as disrupting their criminal networks. The WJC works with law enforcement, policymakers, intergovernmental organizations, and NGO entities to advance the cause of wildlife justice and over the long term help create sustainable solutions. UNODC, I believe that we don't have to introduce them in detail. Everybody knows about UNODC, the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime with the headquarters in Vienna, established in 1997 as the Office for Drug Control and Crime Prevention and renamed to the United, uh, United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime in 2002. 
UNODC was established to assist the UN in better addressing a coordinated, comprehensive response to the inter interrelated issues of illicit trafficking in uh, and abuse of drugs, crime prevention and criminal justice, international terrorism and political corruption. The office aims long-term to better equip governments to handle drug, crime, terrorism and corruption related issues, to maximize knowledge on these issues and uh, among governmental institutions and agencies, and also to maximize awareness of these matters in public opinion, globally, nationally and at community level. And FITI, the Fisheries Transparency Initiative, has been developed as a unique effort that complements and supports other national, regional, and global efforts for achieving responsible fisheries governance. The FITI is a global partnership that seeks to increase transparency and participation for a more sustainable management of marine fisheries. By making fisheries management more transparent and inclusive, the FIDI promotes informed public debates on fisheries policies and supports the long-term contribution of the sector to national economies and the well-being of citizens and businesses that depend on a healthy marine environment. We are very happy to host uh, you today virtually together with our esteemed speakers who will, among other things, try to shed the light on the nexus between corruption and environmental crime, as well as to identify the best methods to address this phenomenon. My name is Tatiana Jankovic. I work at the Training and Capacity Development Department at the International Anti-Corruption Academy, and I am the part of the team organizing and supporting this event from IACA's side. I will give you a few information about the event itself. Uh, this webinar is scheduled to take approximately 90 minutes. Please note that this webinar will be recorded and will be made available uh, in short time on IACA's webpage. We will welcome your questions during the sessions, which you can address using the Q&A window, which you will find at the bottom of the screen. And at the end of the presentation, we will have an official Q&A session where we will provide you with an opportunity to raise your questions directly to the panel. Our speakers will try to answer as many questions as they can, obviously, during this session and also using the chat function. As previously mentioned, this is the first in the series of webinars on the nexus between corruption and environmental crime. And please visit IACA website in near future for more information about the following two webinars in the series, Transversal, Transversal Corruption and Environmental Crime, which will take place in December, and also Corruption and Law Enforcement Efforts to Tackle Environmental Crimes, which is scheduled for February next year. So I have now bombarded you with a lot of information. I will just take uh, one minute more of your time to introduce our moderator for today. Our moderator is Mr. Vincent Opiene. He's uh, the chief executive officer and founder of National Resource Conservation Network. Vincent's organization investigates arrests and prosecutes wildlife traffickers in Uganda. His team fights corruption and the illegal and legal wildlife trade. The organization has for, from 2014 until today arrested and prosecuted some 960 wildlife traffickers. He is a winner of 2017 Ugandan Government Award for the Outstanding Contribution of Wildlife in Uganda and Task Award 2018 for the Best Upcoming Conservation Practice in Africa. Vincent is also a legal practitioner in Uganda, and we are very proud to say that he is also Ayaka alumnus. Vincent, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tatiana. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining us in today's webinar, which is about understanding the nexus between environmental crime and corruption. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is our first webinar, and it's very important to us because corruption impacts a lot on environmental crime and law enforcement. And um, today we are looking at corruption 
in flora and fauna. So we are considering three areas in the flora and fauna. And the first area that we are going to look at is a corruption in the wildlife sector. We will also discuss about corruption in the fishery sector and hand with corruption in the forestry sector. This concerns us a lot as human beings because corruption in these areas impact negatively on the conservation of wildlife, forests, and fisheries. And if such corruption is not addressed, it can cause massive destruction that impacts on humanity. For example, in Uganda, we lost all our rhinos to corruption. We hunted all the rhinos down, loaded them, and have them sold. Nobody was taking full charge and control. And because of that, we now have no rhinos. We just have to start bringing back the rhinos. And the cost of bringing back the rhinos is enormous. In that, you have to pay a lot of money to buy rhinos from other countries, import them, bring them to your country. You have to take care of them to ensure that they reproduce, then you, you reintroduce them to the wild, and yet they have been there before. So that impacts on a country because it affects tourism, and it also affects the ecosystem services that such species are supposed to render. A corruption also impacts a lot on the forestry side, because if we finish all the tree covers, then we are going to have serious issues with climate change because the trees are all gone. So we need to do all it takes to ensure that we conserve the trees and ensure that we fight corruption in the oil processes because all this illegal trade and over-exploitation of the forestry resources, the fisheries resources, and wildlife resources are a result of corruption. So if we remove corruption from the picture, we are most likely going to conserve most of our life, wildlife species, fisheries, and also forestry products. Ladies and gentlemen, today we are blessed to have very great experience and robust speakers that are going to talk to us about the issues of corruption in the three key environmental sectors. May I now use this opportunity to introduce to you our first speaker, Mr. Steve Carmody. Mr. Steve Carmody is the Director of Programs, Wildlife Justice Commission. Mr. Steve, you're most welcome to this session. Um, Alongside Mr. Steve is another speaker called Mr. Tim Steele. Tim is the senior advisor of Corruption and Economic Crime Branch, UNODC. He will also be giving us a talk. And alongside the two is Mr. Shivan Bierman, who is the executive director of Fisheries Transparency Initiative based in Seychelles. So those are the three key speakers that you are going to interface with this afternoon. They have robust experience and they have done this work for quite a long time. Now, without taking a lot of time, may I now take this opportunity to invite Steve to take up the floor and give us your great presentation. Steve, the floor is yours. Thank you, Vincent, for that fantastic introduction. And uh, also thank you to Tatiana for saving myself and all of you uh, <clears throat> about five minutes of me talking about who the WJC is and, and what we do. So thank you to both uh, Vincent and Tatiana. Uh, as Vincent said, my name is Steve Carmody. I'm the head of uh, programs at the WJC. Uh, I've been there since 2015. When we kicked off the organisation, uh, I see a couple of people on the on the call. Uh, shout out to Salamato in the US. I'm sure it's pretty over, early over there, Sal. Sal was 
one of the first investigators with the WJC. So hi to Sal. This is just uh, an indication of where we work and the type of work we do. Um, we have about 53 people working for the WJC. Um, we have over 450 years of law enforcement experience and we primarily focus on those level four and fives that are driving uh, the illegal wildlife trade. So that enables us to come in and look at these networks um, and you know target those individuals within the supply chain that, that cause the greatest damage and therefore by removing them, we have the greatest impact. Um, you know, some of the main areas we work, primates, obviously fisheries, we're just starting off in a fisheries crime. Uh, iconic species, particularly that African Asian nexus, looking at uh, rhino horn, uh, pangolin and ivory. We're coming off the back of some really successful operations that were a number of years in the making. Uh, within the last four months in Africa, we've facilitated the seizure of about uh, 8.3 tonnes of pangolin scales, over 1.2 tonnes of ivory and 43 kilos of rhino horn, targeting some major networks operating there. And, and you know, just by having a look at that, the slide that's in front of you there, you can see where we're working and that we've got a very uh, wide scope of, of type of work we do, but also where we work. And, and obviously we see a lot of corruption in these areas that we do work. Gaspar, the next slide, please. Uh, within the last four years, um, we've provided evidence leading the rest of 153 traffickers in 13 countries and we have a 100% conviction rate in those countries where the matter has been finalised before the court. Where, where we are a little bit different to other NGOs is that our undercover people, those that interact with the traffickers, will go to court and testify if necessary. And uh, we're seeing some of these uh, court cases coming up uh, relatively soon. Um, and obviously we, we use the same sort of methods that law enforcement agencies use for, for major drug cases and we document evidence so that um, it can be used for law enforcement purposes. Gaspar, the next one. Now, obviously with, uh, with corruption, we see that at every, every phase of the supply chain when it comes to uh, wildlife, whether that's in the parks or whether it's through the freight forwarders um, and you know, obviously the people that are driving, driving the trade. So here's a photograph that's, that's taken back in 2018. This photo was taken in Hanoi and it was taken two days after there was a major shipment of rhino horn seized in Southeast Asia. Now, we managed to follow uh, one individual from Malaysia to Hanoi um, and then follow him to a meeting uh, with a number of what we call level four and fives. So three major traffickers in Vietnam, guys that had been operating for years and that had been um, driving in particular the rhino horn trade. And we, we managed to get some people close to these, this group here where they talked for about half an hour about how they could buy back the rhino horn. Um, so this is something that we, we, we hear about a lot and, and we obviously see that seizures are made and those seizures are either sold back to the suspects or uh, wildlife products are, are recirculated after this, they're seized. And this is a, an issue not just in Asia, but it's an issue in Africa as well. So particularly in the, you know, when you were looking at the, these major seizures of ivory and pangolin, um, often uh, we're, we're, we hear that these seizures are making their way back into the supply chain. Gaspard, next slide. So when we start looking at supply chain and corruption, um, and I think it's important to, to identify um, or clarify, you know, when we talk about organised crime in respect to wildlife crime, what we generally see is disorganised crime. Whilst it meets the legal threshold for organised crime, we certainly don't see the level of sophistication that we would see in other major organised crime types. So, like you know, suspects not changing their phones, keeping the same bank accounts for several years. Um, they're not surveillance conscious. Their tradecraft is very poor, <clears throat> and these are people who are at the very top of the tree in respect to wildlife crime in both Africa and Asia. Um, so, you know what. Obviously, that, that you know, brings us to a number of questions. One, is the law enforcement's response just inadequate? Uh, and obviously, this is not every country. Some countries, we have very, very competent law enforcement agencies that do a fantastic job. But we're talking about a supply chain. So whether, you know, it, where, wherever it comes from, within that supply chain, from the source country, through a transit country, to a destination country, or a demand country, uh, 
at every point there's opportunities for corruption and we see these opportunities. So, you know, when we do surveillance on suspects, you know, overwhelmingly they do not perform any surveillance. If you are working a local drug dealer, your local street corner drug dealer, they employ much more sophisticated surveillance and, and operating methods than we see with the top level wildlife traffickers, which has led us to believe that these people are comfortable in their operating environment because they are sure that they're protected in that environment. Now we've followed people around that have had no idea that we've been there, that meet, so, sorry, potential customers in the same coffee shop every day, talking about wildlife crime and, and you know, talking about supplying wildlife products. The, the biggest issue we have is, is you know, uh, finding partners that are, that are prepared to engage uh, and uh, interdict these individuals. Now, obviously, we have some outstanding law enforcement agencies, and I see Al Colby on the call from US Fish and Wildlife. US Fish and Wildlife are, are doing a fantastic job, uh, as are a number of others, including the Chinese Anti-Smuggling Bureau. But obviously, that when we're talking the supply chain, there's opportunities in, in, in countries where law enforcement legal frameworks are less developed and corruption is much more prolific for these traffickers to, um, to operate. And what we also see is a very quick displacement of these networks once the law enforcement frameworks or the, the, or the units become more effective. And probably the best example of that is, is Uganda and the movement of people out of Uganda because of the effectiveness of Vincent's team and, and the law enforcement agencies there. Um, so I'll quickly just run through before I hand back. Uh, this, this presentation is obviously in two parts. So just identifying the issues that we see from park rangers, um, you know, providing information to, to poachers on, on where a rhino or elephants are, um, you know, to freight forwarders, people that facilitate the movement of the goods with, with um, fake bill of ladings or, or um, bill of ladings that have been uh, changed so that they, they hide the, the true source of the container, for example. Customs officers and societies management authority officers. Um, you know, if you have a look at all the pangolins being seized over the last three or four years, and you go back through the bill of ladings of some of those seizures, you know, we have fake addresses, um, you know, fake mobile phone numbers, fake companies, fake uh, uh, email addresses. How would the suspects know that this container has arrived with, without corrupt support, without a customs officer or a freight forwarder who's notifying them that their container has arrived in country on every document, sorry, every uh, item on that document is fake. Um, we have police that tip off suspects, prosecutors that, that, that weaken briefs of evidence and, and judges that, that also uh, keep suspend, uh, postponing matters or, or finding suspects not guilty despite overwhelming evidence. And obviously any organized crime is driven by the money and you know probably um, Today's a, a, a very interesting day to start this, this discussion, considering the Pandora papers came out today, looking at money laundering and you know, accountants and lawyers setting up um, shelf companies, moving money. Although we, are, we see the overwhelming amount of money you know, for wildlife crime is sent through normal bank accounts um, and cash. But you know, there's still, once you get the sophisticated networks, and there are sophisticated networks out there that do move money through offshore accounts and set up set up bogus companies and the like. So that's where we're seeing the connection, the nexus between corruption and wildlife crime. Um, we see it everywhere. Uh, it is the, the lubricant that greases the wheels of wildlife crime. If we remove corruption, we would create a much level playing field. It would be much harder for suspects to move commodities from one side of the world to the other. It would be much harder for, for money to move and it would be much harder for these people to communicate safely as they do now. So um, I look forward to what the other speakers have to say in relation to timber and fisheries crime, but in respect to wildlife crime, as I said, it, uh, corruption is the lubricant that greases the well. Thank you, Vincent, back to you. Thank you, thank you so much, um, Steve, for giving us that elaborate background on the Nexus. Uh, between corruption and environmental crime, and also for giving us the insight on how corruption manifests in wildlife trafficking crime. Our second speaker is Mr. Tim Steele. Tim, you're most welcome. 
Thank you very much indeed, Vincent. Um, just to be clear that what I'm actually going to be talking about is corruption and forest loss. I started a few years ago looking at corruption in the timber trade and realized that you couldn't actually look on that sort of limited basis. You were only seeing a small part of the story. If we think broadly about how forests are managed, we would come out with, we come out with three embedded levels of forest management, a sort of strategic level where the decisions on how to use forest and forest land are made, a tactical level where sort of longer term planning, such as which land should, which blocks should be logged, how the land might be used after it had been logged, those sort of decisions are made, then a more day-to-day -day operational level. Now, you'll notice I've used, used the word land twice in, des in describing the levels. And the very first thing I think I want to say is that a lot of the corruption is not about timber or wood products, but is actually about getting access or getting hold of the land on which the forest was grown. Now, that's the, the first clue. Now, if you think about the three levels, if you are really sophisticated and you are really big money and you've got real influence into government, perhaps you can get policies, legislation put in place that actually allow for change of land usage to what you want it to be. So whether you want to use the land for infrastructure, for large scale commercial agriculture, for, for mining, whatever, you can perhaps deal at that level. Um, that level of level corruption is the hardest to see, but is, and we, when we get on to the next session on prevention, we'll talk a bit about how what we do might stop it. The second level, this tactical level, this is also large scale, bigger, bigger operators, bigger business, bigger money. You're looking at people perhaps getting to cut where they were in a forest block that wasn't originally planned. You're perhaps looking to get people to grant concessions to one group rather than another. You're perhaps looking to get people to ignore good policies that were put in place. So again, there we start to see corruption manifesting itself. There we start to see cases, particularly in the tropical areas, um, where there's high value use, high value usages of the land, and sometimes high values of timber as well. At the third level, which is the operational level, this is maybe could be anything from sh short scale, sort of short term, small scale, ignoring extending concession borders, maybe ignoring timber scouts going in and identifying trees, sort of more day to day basis. Now, if I try and explain this a little bit further, if in some tropical areas, you'll actually see a seasonal interaction um, between sort of forest loss and corruption. Um, the, in the wet season, what you'll find is selective logging. So scouts will go in, they'll identify the high value trees and those high value trees, specific high value trees will be cut and taken. Now, what you'll see very much there is sort of operational level corruption, where the person who is person who is tasked with patrolling, etc., may take a small fee for turning a blind eye. When it comes to the dry season, what you will see is much more tactical, even strategic level corruption coming to show. You'll see huge swathes of forest getting cut and left to dry 
and left to dry before it burns. I'll let you into a secret. Those of you who don't know, tropical forest doesn't burn naturally or very rarely burns naturally. You actually have to let it dry to burn it. So someone has got to be keeping a very good watch on you from somewhere upstairs that you don't get caught when you cut that down. So that's the next level of interaction. Then what you'll find is the land gets used for something, the timber moves. I'm not going to talk about the timber value chain at all because I think that is well known. What is more interesting is when people use the land, they then grow products. I mean, so-called forest risk commodities, mainly agricultural, the sort of palm oil, the beef, the soy, these move, but quite often there needs to be some form of corruption to enable these to move. When we get to solutions, we'll talk a little bit more about this. So you, you take this framework, you then think about as corruption in the forest starts and corruption in the use of the land starts, what we also see is this gradually expanding circle. So you end up in some countries where you have the situation where to actually even get a job in forestry, you actually you need to pay and you need to pay into the corrupt networks because there is so much value in allowing that land to go. Now, here's a finisher from me for the first round, is quite often a government might quite legitimately make a policy to cut down forests that many of us would like to see protected. Um, and that is quite legitimate. Feed your, feed your citizens today. But what we see, of course, is that policy comes in and then corrupt businesses, powerful individuals, instead of the, for, the pro proceeds of the land going to the citizen, they go to the very few and to the elites and to the wealthy. And that, in that way, we might not like the policy, but we're, also the policy does not achieve its desired outcome. And anyway, I'll leave you there. Hopefully I've described a framework. It looks very different to other types of environmental crime in this respect. Okay, thank you very much. Hopefully I haven't confused everyone completely. No, you haven't, thank you. Thank you so much, Tim. Um, thank you for giving us an insight on the strategic, tactical and operational level of corruption. We very much appreciate this. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, our next speaker is Shivan, Shivan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Vincent. And um, Kushraf, could you share the presentation? I'm unable to share the screen. That would be helpful. Uh, yes, I will. So just a second, okay. please. Yeah. Sure, thanks. Great. And uh, yeah, also thanks to Yaka for, for having us um, back here and for including us in, in this uh, program and in this webinar. What, what I wanted to, to touch base on um, talking corruption in, uh, in, in fisheries is something that, that's quite often um, forgotten, and that is how absolutely crucial uh, the ocean is to, to the well-being of, uh, of this planet. It's not just that you know, uh, the ocean covers 70% uh, of our um, surface, but it also is responsible for between 50 and 80% of the oxygen um, uh, production. So uh, a healthy ocean is absolutely crucial. Um, it matters and uh, fisheries is a crucial part of, uh, of, a healthy, uh, of a healthy ocean. Now, we can say that our ocean currently is, is in stress. And if we wanna make this very simplistic, we can nail it down to three big uh, aspects. One is climate change. The other one is pollution, and uh, the third one is overexploitation, and that is very relevant also for uh, for fisheries. So, if we look into a um, bit more of what what actually drives the topic of uh, overexploitation, and Kusha, if you can go to the next slide. No, nope, other way. <laughs> 
Yeah, one more. Perfect. And you can see uh, there are a number of um, aspects that drive you know, us taking too much resources out of the ocean. Um, there's overcapacity, and we'll talk about that in uh, just, a, just a minute. Uh, there's legal overfishing, that is, you know, fishing uh, above the thresholds that you're supposed to um, go uh, fishing and getting a license for that. There's a lot of um, talk these days on something that's called IUU fishing, which is illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing, you know, in, in very simple terms, you know, illegal fishing means you go fishing um, without uh, a license. There are other, uh, other areas, but there's one kind of a horizontal um, driver that impacts uh, a lot of these, uh, these aspects here, and that is, that is corruption. And interesting enough, um, and I said that before, corruption in fisheries does not get a lot of attention. Um, you very seldom find, you know, headline grabbing news about uh, corruption in, in the fishery sector. We had some examples in Mozambique, we had some examples in, in Namibia, but the question really is, you know, is that because there is no corruption in, in the sector or is it uh, because you know, we're not paying uh, enough attention to this? And I think if we're um, looking at the influencing factors, uh, you will see it's uh, it's the second aspect. We are not paying enough attention to corruption in uh, in the fishery sector. Next. So if you're looking into you know, corruption, and those of you who have been to some of the courses from the International Anti-Corruption Academy, um, you always look in, you know, in the risk assessment at some something called red flags. So what are some indications whether there is a higher uh, probability that uh, corruption may take place in, uh, in this particular sector. So if I can highlight a few of those um, red flags, I think it will paint a picture of a sector that is very prone to corruption. First of all, um, we have extremely high competition in, in fisheries. If you look at the numbers, you know, the amount of fishing vessels in the 50s was at 1.7. We're now at almost 4.6. In, in 2018, and a huge majority of those vessels are um, registered in, in Asia with uh, uh, slightly above uh, three, 3 million vessels. What's also an important point is that these vessels are increasingly being uh, motorized, which means they can go further distances. They can go to other jurisdictions. And that is an aspect that obviously adds a sense of uh, complexity um, to the topic as well. And we see also a number of um, days at sea, you know, the, the amount of days that it takes you to, to reach your desired um, catch limit. So we have high competition, but that is complemented with a decreasing resource, which in itself is not a very healthy uh, linkage. Next slide, please. So if you look at uh, some of the, uh, the information that uh, our colleagues from the UN FAO are producing on a, on a fairly regular basis. Um, 40 years ago, um, we had 90% of the fish stocks were fished at a sustainable level, which means you take the certain amount of fish out of the ocean and after a certain period of time, it reproduces itself so that you basically could, in theory, uh, fish uh, indefinitely. Now that number has, uh, changed to 65.8%, which means in other terms, 34% of the fish stocks right now are at biologically unsustainable level. At that little um, chart that you can see, that's the orange part of that. So we have more people looking for fish. We have fewer fish in the ocean. And in addition to that, what is getting actually taken out of the ocean 35% of that, uh, what is fished is either loss or wasted, which again, puts a bit more pressure on, uh, on the resource. And then you have to add, you know, warming oceans, ocean acidification, which means that some of the fish are already moving away from their traditional uh, habitats to, to other places. So a lot of competition with a decreasing uh, resource and and I think that is something that is very often forgotten is how extremely valuable 
fisheries is from a from a global uh, perspective. Steve just mentioned, you know, uh, the aspect of money, and I think that is one of the the key drivers of uh, of corruption, you know, in in any of these natural resources sector. Uh, next slide, please. Now you can see some of, you know, of of the numbers here, and obviously there are certain species that are extremely valuable on on the market, in particular some of the, the tuna species. But what is I think quite interesting is it's not just that you know the values of um, fishing itself or of of export are mind boggling, and you know, let, let's keep in mind in in monetary terms, fish is the most traded agriculture product in the world. Uh, it is a combination of coffee, tea, and sugar. Altogether, uh, fish is above that, um, that threshold. But what we're seeing is not just the value in itself. It's also, it will probably grow in the future. And the reason that is, is that a lot of people realize how healthy fish is um, for their diet. And compared with um, other food types like you know, beef or pork, fish has a very low carbon footprint. And as we, we are seeming to, to change our prospect of, you know, our, our, our understanding of climate change, there's more and more people turn to fish as their primary choice for their, um, for their diet. So we, we can summarize that as, uh, an economic pressure situation. And that obviously uh, provides opportunities for um, wrongdoings. Um, it provides opportunities for unhealthy risk taking, uh, et cetera. But in addition to that economic pressure that we have in fisheries, we have tremendously complex uh, value uh, chains. So I'm gonna very briefly go on the next slide uh, on, on that particular uh, aspect. Yeah, we can just skip that. Yeah, so when we, when we talk about you know, the, the value chain, basically from the sea, when you take out the fish to the plate, when it arrives um, in, in your home, um, there are a number of steps uh, that are involved. If you can just click one more, push off. I can you know, zoom that in. Yes, this is actually taken out of a, um, a guideline that the UNODC published uh, two years ago called Rotten Fish, a guide on addressing corruption in the fishery sector. You can see um, the various process steps in the value chain. You can see the number of authorities that, uh, that work with uh, as part of this value chain. And you know, very often uh, these um, processes and these authorities span multiple jurisdictions. So, in addition to economic pressure, we have a sector that can be defined with um, a lot of complexity. And to add all that, you know, the, another and probably the final red flag on understanding, you know, how prone the sector is to corruption, is um, on the next slide. Yeah, one more, and that is, you know, a very challenging monitoring, control, and uh, surveillance aspect in, in fisheries. If a forest burns down, um, you see it. If the rhinos are gone, um, you see it fairly quickly. It's much more difficult to detect whether there's illegal fishing uh, going on in the ocean. Most of the activities happen behind you know, the, the horizon. Um, fishes are not that directly uh, visible. So. In, in addition to the challenges that law enforcement agencies have to you know, monitor, control, and surveil, there's also in, in the general population, uh, something that we find quite disturbing, to be honest, and that is this out of mind, out of sight mentality. And, and that means the fishery sector does not get enough attention to, to look into these, into these sectors. And I said from the beginning that the sector is one of the, uh, you know, is very prone to corruption, but it's also one that escaped the limelight for, for so long. And I think it has a lot to do with that. You don't directly see the, the issues that you may see in other um, uh, natural resources uh, crime. So that altogether uh, paints, from my point of view, a very clear picture that you know um, there are at least five red flags 
waving all over the place um, when it comes to corruption in, in that sector. Happy to talk about that a bit, little bit uh, further, but um, handing it over back to, to Vincent now for, uh, for our second round of uh, questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Shivan, and uh, thank you so much, our speakers, for the great work in making us know how corruption manifests in the environmental sector. Um, we have to take uh, some few questions. We are going to have um, the first question in regards to the presentations that you have made. Then thereafter, you present the second part of your talk. And the first question goes to Steve. Uh, Steve, I want to give you two questions that I go, then you answer them, <laughs> then you answer them all. <laughs> so the first one is that, um, how does corruption manifest along wildlife trafficking supply chain? And uh, the following one is, uh, um, is corruption in wildlife trafficking different from the one in other environmental crimes? Those are the two questions for you, Steve. Thanks, Vincent. Yeah. Um, uh, so how does corruption manifest along the supply chain? Um, basically, when you look at, for example, let's take uh, rhino uh, horn trafficking uh, as an example. Um, you have your source countries in Africa and your destination countries in Southeast Asia, primarily Vietnam and China. So the, the price of a rhino horn will vary obviously along that supply chain and, and at every part of that supply chain, there is a price to pay to move that rhino horn. Obviously we see people that, that will try to move the products on their own and often they're picked up by, by customs or, or border officials along that supply chain. So if you're moving someone, if a poaching network is moving from say Messenger in Mozambique into Kruger National Park, it's, you know, so Kruger's the size of Israel. So these guys often need intelligence on where the rhinos are within the park. And sometimes that intelligence may come from corrupt officials within the park. Sometimes it, you know, it may come from, from other individuals that, that frequent the park or, you know, or tour guides or, or the like. But, you know, so for these guys to go into the park, often they, they receive intelligence on the location of, of rhinos, or they may receive intelligence on the location of rhinos. Once they have the horn, that horn has to move along the supply chain so you know there are there are local police that man checkpoints and sometimes these provide vehicles to move the the rhino horn or they uh, they may allow the rhino horn to pass then often with rhino and particularly in, in covid much of the rhino horn is now being moved in um, air freight whereas previously it was being taken by by mules there were a number of incidents where we were aware that containers of rhino horn uh, were, were utilised, but you know, with COVID, a number of routes were shut down. In particular, the the, the hand carried rhino horn. So, most of the recent seizures are, are cargo that are moving out of Southern Africa to Southeast Asia. Uh, Malaysia is one point where um, uh, this stuff is is being picked up. So then you're looking at freight forwarding companies, potential corrupt customs officers at both ends of the supply chain. Or if it's a transit, you know, that is that cargo being picked up and then changed, uh, rerouted with different paperwork from, from say, Malaysia. We had a, a major seizure in Malaysia a few weeks ago. And then, you know, once it, once it lands, it still has to get from, uh, from, you know, that Asian country, whether it's Vietnam or, or Malaysia, through to the primary source country, which is China. So then we're looking at people taking it across the border. Um, you know, so at every opportunity, there's... Sorry, at every, at every stage, there's opportunities for corrupt actors to get engaged. And, you know, to put this in perspective, we're seeing rhino horn, you know, fluctuates, but between five and 7,000 a kilo for front horn in Mozambique. You know, that might go up to twelve to 15,000 in a per kilo in Vietnam. But when you look at the monthly wage of a, a law enforcement officer or a government official in Vietnam, it might be you know, $500 a month. So it doesn't take too much money to be already making much more than your salary uh, in respect to what these traffickers can offer you. 
Um, and if you could repeat the second question for me, please, Vincent. Or Gaspard, if you picked up that second question. Yes. The second question is that is corruption in wildlife trafficking different from the one in, the, in other environmental crimes? Well, the, often you'll have the same corrupt actors because the, you know, the same choke points exist across multiple um, you know, environmental crime types, you know, whether it's uh, the CITES management official that's authorising the movement of, of, um, of Rosewood. That may be the same person that's authorising the movement of wildlife. You know, when you look at the rhino horns that came out of South Africa in, say, 2000, between 2007 and 2010, there were a lot of horns that were sent out under the guise of, of hunting. Um, but when you look at the sightings permits that were issued in South Africa, they don't correspond with the sightings permits that were issued in, in Vietnam. Or you look at the, the sightings permits that were, you know, moving product from Southern Africa to, to Czech Republic or to Poland. Um, and, and, you know, one area where we do see a lot of corruption uh, is in the area of, of brown crimes in, in waste disposal. Um, and it's, look, it's very similar. It's, you know, government officials being bribed to either issue part permits or, or you know, to issue certificates um, to enable products to move. So, you know, look, the, and the other thing to, to be conscious of when we're talking about corruption and wildlife crime, the one thing we often find in this sector is that we try to reinvent the wheel, try to do things from scratch when, 99 times out of 100, it's already, you know, from an enforcement perspective, it's already been done in other crime types, particularly drugs and, and human trafficking. What we're not doing is taking those models that we know work elsewhere and applying them to wildlife crime, and in particularly in relation to corruption. And I'll touch on that as we, we reach into the second phase. But I think you'll find that there's similarities across all crime types when it comes to corrupt actors. Thank you, Vincent. Thank you so much. Uh, Steve. Uh, the next question is for Tim. Tim, Tim, are you there? I am indeed. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. Um, our next question is about uh, the three strategic, the three levels, which is the strategic, tactical, and operational. And the question is uh, that uh, does corruption manifest in the same manner at all those three levels, or they manifest differently? Um, obviously, there is interlinkage between the three levels, but I think particularly at that, that sort of strategic level, that very long term, sort of 10 year to 50 year sort of planning horizon, where you're setting policy, you're setting state policy, and you've got sort of lobby groups, you've got industry groups looking to influence, that looks a bit different to the more the tactical and operational, the operational would look very much like Steve described, it's just different products. But the, th the thing you've got to look at as well in forestry is you're not just talking about the timber, you're talking about other commodities that have been developed or bred or grown on forest land also moving. So you, so the same, the same licenses, same movement, same things. At a tactical level, you're going to see bribes for concessions, you're going to see bribes for permits. Same story, just maybe different permits. Then you're going to, um, at the, down at the operational level, you're going to see, yeah, exactly the CITES permits, sometimes for timber species, exactly the, the bribe to not actually inspect the number of items on a truck, all of these things. So it's going to look very much the same. So you get those, but at, the, at that strategic, very high level, you get that difference. And the other difference you get, which is interesting, is a lot of the stuff linked to forest loss is done by businesses and quite often big businesses. And what you quite often see is bribes to the authorities that regulate those businesses. Again, it's the, the, the underlying story is the same. It's just where you need to look for the conduct that differs. Okay, does that answer, sort of answer the question? Uh, yes, you have, and thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Tim. 
And our next question goes to uh, Shivan. Shivan, your question is uh, that, um, what are the main factors in influencing corruption in the fishery sector? Uh, yeah, I, I think the, the main points I, I just highlighted in the, um, in, in the presentation, what, what I think is, is something that is, is underappreciated is right now the, the difficulty of, get, of getting um, the discussion started on corruption in, in fisheries. And it has something to do with what I said earlier that it's you know, this out of mind, um, out, of, out of sight uh, mentality. I think um, I've been working in, in anti-corruption for, for quite some time. And I think we've made tremendous progress over the last, let's say, 10, 15 years when it comes to policies on the international level, on the national level, on, on implementation, tools, guidelines. I mean, there's, there's everything already out there. Um, and I think there's also quite a bit of awareness in the general um, public now on the issues of corruption. Um, and in, in the fishery sector, that is almost not existent. And I've, I have to say that was really surprising when we, when we started um, work there. And it, it's very challenging because you know, it's 2021, you wanna jump in and wanna you know, start looking at some potential you know, solution ideas and do a risk assessment and all these things. But actually what you're doing is you, you're talking about why is that needed and what is it? And how can we, you know, how can we you know, look at that? And there are a number of aspects that where, where fisheries is really behind. Um, you know, Steve mentioned, you know, the Pandora uh, papers that, that just came out, and there's a lot of talk around, you know, beneficial ownership or ultimate beneficial ownership. That is a concept that is very slowly just getting into the fishery sector. So it's it's sometimes, you know fairly frustrating for us working in that sector. Um, coming into that particular area where, where you see, you know, all the red flags are waving in the wind and, you know, the mindset is not ready yet because you still need to do a lot of advocacy work to actually start getting on this, uh, on this um, operational level, as, as Tim, Tim mentioned, to really get down to, to, some, of the, uh, to some of the issues. so much our speakers we now want to hear from you about um, what needs to be done to address the challenges of corruption in the three sectors of wildlife fisheries and forestry and we again starting with steve and steve the floor is yours Sorry, uh, Vincent, I was just answering one of those questions. Um, look, as I said it, uh, previously, that you know, we don't have to reinvent the world in respect to corruption and wildlife crime. Um, you know, when we, when we look at uh, some of the things that we're seeing, you know, and I touched on it earlier, is that we, we do see different levels of organisation. Now, some trafficking networks are very sophisticated, but the majority that we see are not. And they create, you know, there's lots of opportunities for law enforcement to disrupt and dismantle these networks across that global supply chain. Um, and you know, a, a classic case of that is the Chroma case, which I, I know that Vincent was played an integral role in, in that case. Um, you know, this is a global trafficking network, and, and you know, the US Fish and Wildlife have done a fantastic job to take on that network. But this is something that we, we should see a lot more of. Um, you know, that. The, in particular, the lack of follow-up on seizures. You know, we have these massive seizures uh, and, and, you know, we see customs agencies rolling out their, their press releases, but that's where it stops. You know, we just don't see those follow-up investigations both up and down the supply chain and, and also touched on, you know, previously the, you know, products being returned to the, to the trade. Another really important thing, I think, as well, is that at some stage... You have to share the intelligence with other agencies, even if you don't particularly trust those other agencies, because obviously trust is earned. And uh, unless you take the risk 
to share that intelligence. Um, at the end of the day, the only people that, that benefit from you not sharing intelligence are the trafficking networks. Because if you represent a, a silo and, and that information doesn't leave your silo, but it could be so effective for other law enforcement agencies down the supply chain, well, at the end of the day, you're the roadblock. And, and you know, whilst you may have, you know, reasons not to trust law enforcement, at the end of the day, you know, you should trust them, share the information, obviously put safeguards in place to protect sources and that sort of thing. But, you know, information that is not shared or timely is, is useless. The next slide, please, Gaspar. And so in, in relation to recommendations, as I said, I'm not trying to reinvent the wheel. It's all been done before. The first and foremost is undertake parallel financial investigations. And I see that the Bayesian Institute was uh, received two grants from uh, the Challenge Fund, I believe one in Uganda with Vincent's team. Follow the money. Criminals don't care if you take product from them, but they do care if you take their house, they care if they, you take the money out of their bank accounts and you stop their kids going to um, expensive schools, often in other countries. Follow the money. And, and look, we just don't see that. And, and it's, not as, it's not as simple as saying, all right, well, you're a wildlife investigator, investigate the financial aspects of wildlife crime. You really need trained and specialist people to do this role. I remember when I was a detective and I did mainly drug and organised crime work, I used to hate having to follow the money. It was just days and days and days of, of, you know, getting subpoenas and search warrants and then months pouring over, you know, financial records. Obviously, the agencies I used to work for, that was replaced very quickly by a multitude of, of, of agencies within the country that would follow the money. And literally, you would push the button on submitting the charge of someone for a serious drug offence, and then you would be having to answer any money laundering questions. So, you know, that's, for me, that's the first thing that we should do to address corruption, because if you follow the money, you'll find out who the real players are, and then you'll find out who's facilitating the crime. The second thing is utilise special investigative techniques, such as controlled deliveries, undercover operatives, telephone intercepts, listening devices. We just don't see these used enough. Now, I know there's been a, a number of, of small successes, I believe, in respect to wildlife crime. But, you know, often we see these products seized and that's it, as I said. And, you know, even if you took the product out and only left a fraction of the product in and let it run to see who it would go to, that would be better than just seizing it. Because often on these bill of ladings are false names, false addresses, false phones and false email accounts, as I touched on before. Automate processes. If you want to apply for a permit, it should be online. There should be, uh, um, in, you know, a, a, a ch uh, electronic evidence chain in respect to any permit. It's, you know, a, an external agency or, or someone within that agency should be able to see who was involved at every stage of a permit. Um, establish vetted units. Look, you know, the, and we're starting to see this a lot. Um, the one thing with vetted units is that, the, you know, obviously... They're very effective. Um, they can be costly to set up and run. The one thing you need to be careful of is that the crime doesn't displace to another country. So, you know, vetted units are great, but I, when I look at vetted units, I think of it on a regional level rather than a country level, um, because often the criminals would just move to a board, you know, into a jurisdiction where law enforcement is weaker or the legal framework is weaker. But certainly vetted units are proving their worth in Africa. Uh, another area is empower anti-corruption units. So. Most of the countries where we see wildlife crime uh, trafficking is, is an issue have anti-corruption units. But often these anti-corruption units are passive and we don't see them proactively targeting or looking at wildlife crime traffickers. Sorry, wildlife products uh, traffickers. So, you know, instead of, uh, instead of being passive, start looking at, uh, proactively looking at high-risk individuals or high-risk positions. Um, and in particular, look at the money flows. Now, it, you know, often it's the officer itself that has to submit the financial report, but sometimes that financial report doesn't extend to family members or businesses. So, you know, follow the money there as well. And another really powerful tool for, for any corruption agencies is integrity testing, you know, proactively testing the integrity of individuals. Uh, and it's something that I've never heard of within the wildlife crime space. And finally, and, and you know, to me, probably most importantly, along with parallel financial investigations, is to revisit historical cases. Go back, you know, often in, in wildlife crime, we're looking at what's right in front of us, 
and that's all. We certainly don't look what's coming um, and often we don't look what's been. So, you know, there's been dozens and dozens of major seizures. We need to go back and look at these seizures, go through all the paperwork because every time a, a container moves, someone pays for that container. Every time that there's a bill of lading issued, someone issues that bill of lading. So let's go back and start looking at it, looking at the phone records of these suspects. If there's been phones seized, doing analysis of those phones, because I guarantee you the case is on the phone. Um, you know, looking at, at, at phone records of officials, seeing who they're talking to on, you know, on the days leading up to and after a seizure. You know, it's a matter of all these cases have evidence already there. So you have your starting point. Rather than a seizure being the end of the investigation, it should be the beginning of the investigation, both from a criminal perspective, but also from a corruption perspective. So, you know, there's certainly a lot of seizures that, that agencies can go back at and look through, look to see who was making phone calls on the days, as I said. You know, there's, there's certainly opportunities. And, you know, we see this in lots of other crime types. We just don't see it in wildlife crime. And now back to you, Vincent. Thank you once again, um, Steve, for giving us an insight on what needs to be done. Uh, it is actually very important that we follow the money and make a legal trade unprofitable. Because the reason why they involve in corrupt activities is because it is profitable and they make a lot of money out of it. So when you remove, remove the money out of the picture and make it hard for them to survive without money, no trade will take place. So I think it is very important for us. Uh, we are giving the floor to Tim to advise us on what we need to do to ensure that we fight corruption in uh, the forest and wildlife sector. Okay. Tim, the floor is yours. Okay. In, terms of, in terms of forest laws, thank you, Vincent. Look, I would echo everything Steve said on the enforcement. I would add one additional thing, which is, I think, very relevant to forest, which is build your intel capacity um, you, because, you know, it should, as Sven said, it should be pretty obvious if a whole thousand hectares of forest is on fire, someone should be able to notice, gather the information, see, see where the problem is, build intelligence and add that to what Steve was saying on the rest of the financial side. By the way, I was a forensic accountant once, so I actually quite like the stuff Steve hated, which is good to know. Um, the, I'll focus a little bit on the preventative side. Um, I mentioned the, the three, those three levels. Now, the very first level, strategic level, is very much about developing law and policy. The first thing is have a look at the laws, policies. Are they clear? Do they actually protect the environment or do they allow for the forest to be cut? Um, and are, are they actually biased towards maybe even certain groups of people cutting the forest? So clean up your legislation, your policy, even before you get to the enforcement. The next thing is, I, mean, I mentioned the concept of forest risk commodities. This is done for money. People generally don't cut down lots of forests so they can just leave it as, as fallow land. They do it to grow something, to breed something. Now, a lot of countries have got increasingly robust legislation around timber imports, timber usage. Because remember, a lot of, you've got the export and domestic markets, a lot of these products. However, in terms of the other forest risk commodities, that may have a much greater value than the actual timber going out. So the soy, the palm oil, the beef in particular, I mean, beef in terms of climate change is a double hit. You know, takes the trees out, takes away the carbon soak, and then the actual beef industry is self-generating carbon, double hit. But those industries, there is not the same level of sort of control in the importing countries. So we're starting to see some jurisdictions develop this legislation that will control the imports that make it harder for large businesses 
to actually exploit forest land illegally and then move the product into markets around the world. So that's very much your strategic high level stuff. But linked to that as well is you know, information to the consumer. Um, you know, I mean, there are probably in this call quite a lot of ethical consumers even. Um, you know, if the consumer knows that what the, what by buying this product from this from this country, there's a fair chance you're actually contributing to a legal forest loss. It will reduce the chances of buying, takes away more of the incentive. Um, then carrying on, if you start looking at the link tactical data operational, you have enforcement, but you also need to look at the sort of control systems within the organizations that manage the various different types of licenses. Do these organizations talk to each other? Do these organizations actually have, have adequate controls? Do, do we understand where the risks lie? Do we actually understand what is what is driving it? What is driving the chance of this corruption happening? Do we do we build uh, on the ground our structures? Say say it's a licensing process. It's not clear which bit of forest has been licensed has been licensed to be cut. Do we have a system that will adequate that could adequately manage it if it was followed? So building the systems, and then at that point, once you've strengthened your systems, your structures, you've got a better chance that if someone does step out of line and acts correctly, that you will actually catch them and you can move into the into the enforcement chain. But going right back to where I started, um, a lot of this stuff is, is not so secret. A lot of this stuff is not so hidden. There's a lot of you guys who are probably sitting in this call, civil society organizations, a lot of people in the communities who know what's going on. Um, and with forest, it's damn difficult to hide it. You know, a tree was there, a tree's been cut down. A forest was there, a forest's been cut down. Somehow, somehow the enforcement authorities failed to notice this. Somehow they failed to learn about it. Build, build the intelligence, use the intelligence, follow the money, take it then at the other end, take the incentive out. Take that huge, huge financial incentive out. I can't quite sort of compete with Sven's number on fisheries, but the forest numbers are big. Uh, and for these commodities, we're talking export markets in the hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars. You know, these guys are there to make a profit, make it difficult, squeeze the profit, and if they do it, catch them. Okay, back to you, Vincent. Thank you so much, uh, Tim. And uh, we are now getting to you, Shivan, to share with us your experiences on what we need to do to address the challenges. Shivan, the floor is yours. Yeah, Khrushchev, can you put the, the slides back up? And, you know, non surprisingly, coming from a fisheries transparency initiative, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about, you know, the, the aspect of transparency as a possible solution. Um, to, to countering corruption, because quite often when you hear about, you know, so what do we do, you know, what should we um, implement? You know, transparency is often hailed as, you know, the go-to solution. It's very cheap. You know, it's much easier than to set up an effective law enforcement um, agency, uh, et cetera. And I, I certainly don't want to downplay the, you know, the effectiveness or the relevance of transparency in that, but I also want to offer a bit of a different perspective um, on the value of transparency. And I'm taking that a little bit out of, of the fisheries context, because I think it's it's very broadly applicable. So Khrushchev, if you can go, I think it's two slides more. I'm looking a little bit also on the time, so we can skip that one. Yeah. So when we look at transparency as you know, a solution to tackle corruption, 
it often comes down to, you know, um, the role is to prevent and deter corruption, knowing that if something is made transparent, the person would not do it in the first place because, you know, he would get caught right, right-handed. And then the second aspect is, you know, there's a role of transparency in detecting corruption. So corruption took place, and then by making information publicly available, um, you would see that there is uh, something wrongdoing. You know, the um, often termed the, the smoking gun kind of uh, kind of aspect. Um, uh, sorry, uh, Kusa, one more. Just uh, I have too many animations in the in that uh, presentation. No, uh, if you just go back um, for a moment. Um, but the key thing is transparency can only be you know effective if we understand the, the different systems. I think. Steve and Tim, you know, laid it out very nicely where, you know, there are uh, common aspects between wildlife, forestry, and, and fisheries, and where there are a difference, whether it comes to, you know, the, the supply chain, whether it comes to, you know, the, the product, you know, maybe in, in wildlife, you know, the single product, the single rhino horn, you know, it, is what you're looking at, whereas in, in fisheries, you know, it's, it's a much bigger um, aspect or amount of, uh, of fish that you're looking at that is uh, using corruption to get through the, the value chain. So when we look at transparency as a way of tackling corruption, there are a number of aspects that we need to need, need to take into account. And none of them, you know, is, is rocket science. But I think all together uh, paint a, a bit of a clearer picture that I think sometimes we're missing when we're just you know, throwing the word transparency out there and, and thinking it would just magically solve all, all our problems. If you can go to the, to the next slide, uh, yeah. So first of all, it starts with the definition of expectation. What is it that you actually want to tackle when it comes to um, you know, transparency countering corruption? Is it, do you want to prevent corruption in the first place so it doesn't happen? Or are you using transparency to detect it? That requires different approaches. What kind of corruption are we actually talking about? Is it you know the bribery, the kickbacks? Is it the the embezzlement? You know somebody stealing um, government revenues, uh, etc. And there, there are all kinds, obviously, of, of different um, manifestations of corruption. And it's important that we're a bit more nuanced when we're talking about you know corruption. Actually, saying very clearly what is it that we that we want to to look at because that shapes a, a lot of, in particular, technical consideration. So when we're talking about transparency, let's, let's say transparency as a way of um, countering embezzlement, you know, whether you know, public official is stealing fisheries revenues, uh, which, which we've seen in, in some cases, in particular in, in Africa. That, first of all, defines the type of information that you're looking at. You know, you're looking at fishing licenses uh, on the one side, how much have you issued? You're looking at uh, revenues, income, on the other side, and just to see is, if there's a gap which could provide an, an insight whether there's some uh, embezzlement uh, taking place. That obviously, that type of information is different if you're looking into you know, uh, bribery. There's also the disclosure approach. Um, there's almost like a philosophical debate about you know, reactive transparency or proactive transparency. Now, reactive is it's not automatically published by the government, but you have to ask for it, maybe under an access to information law, whereas proactive is what the government voluntarily publishes on, um, on, the, in, on the website, for example. Now, if you're looking for a smoking gun, you know, if you're looking for detecting corruption, a proactive approach may not be the most um, sufficient one, unless you have a very um, stupid government who is just publishing that information that incriminates them. Um, right away. But uh, you know, again, it's something that you need to take into consideration. Reliability and usability, very important when it comes to looking at certain aspects. And we had big discussions in the Fisheries Transparency Initiative about the level of aggregated information. If you want to look at whether you know, certain vessels didn't pay or certain payments from vessels didn't make it to, to the budget, then you need to have information on a vessel by vessel level. Whereas, you know, lots of time you see information on, you know, a flag state level or as a fleet level, and you don't really understand and you don't really are able to see whether some vessels did something wrong or whether some uh, of the, the money, you know, that you want to follow 
didn't reach the, the designated um, target. Now, um, I'm going to skip a little bit on the commitment and uh, the citizen engagement part because I touched a little bit on it. But I think a key aspect is um, the accountability ecosystem. Because in what we've seen, and I think Steve and Tim can, can relate to that, is in a, most of the countries that we're working in, we just don't have that accountability ecosystem. Yeah, we're, we're building it, there's certain parts of it. Um, but you know, what good does it do if you do all the you know, um, law enforcement things and you get somebody and then he, he gets a slip, slap on the wrist and he's off again and, and doing the same, the same thing again. So the point that I wanted to make, and push up if you can go to the next slide is, the transparency might actually be of a bit of a different, different value. So if you look at that, that quote, which is from the global lead of anti-corruption, um, openness and transparency at the World Bank, it, it pretty much, you know, makes that case for you know this accountability ecosystem that you need to have certain functions in place in order to uh, prevent corruption in the first place detect corruption and also to to prosecute it but you know if you click on the uh, one more um, just to get the yeah, yeah but these conditions you know whether it is a sanctioning system whether it whistleblower protection whether it's effective law enforcement are exactly not existent in the countries you know, where there are a lot of fisheries resources, where there's a lot of forestry, wildlife, um, uh, et cetera. And that goes hand in hand with you know, a lack of, of government uh, transparency. So without downplaying the role that transparency can have in order to prevent corrupt acts and possibly also detect corrupt acts, my personal view is, and it can go to the ne to the next and my last slide, um, is that you know there is a growing appreciation that the actual power of transparency is a bit more indirect, and that is to really work towards that accountability to ecosystem and and really start discussions on how does the government work, how are they doing, you know, monitoring. It's great if they say. We're devoting, you know, thirty percent of our ocean as a no-take area. But if that thirty percent area is the size of France and Turkey combined, how how on earth are you going to monitor that with three patrol boats and one helicopter? Yeah. And you know, discussing on okay, now that we made all that money, who's going to benefit from this? How can we make? How can we build that that system? So instead of focusing on that typical aspect, oh, transparency is great, detecting corruption, you know, finding the smoking gun, finding the bad guys right away, which is you know, nonsense in the first place. I think the value of transparency as a solution is much, much more on, on supporting that accountability ecosystem, which is much, much needed when it comes to you know, wildlife crime, forestry, and, and, and fisheries. So I, I leave it at that and uh, virtually pass it back over to you, Vincent. Thank you so much, uh, Shivan, the team, and Steve. Um, in the best interest of time, we would like to give our audience the opportunity to ask questions if they have. I don't know whether we have some other questions that have been put in the chat. Maybe we could start with that. Tatiana? Uh, thank you, Vincent. I do not see any questions in the chat. There were a few questions in the Q&A, but uh, Steve and uh, the others have already answered um, those, those questions that were in the Q&A. So this is an opportunity to those uh, attendees who still have not had a chance to ask their question to maybe type it now either in the chat or in the Q&A section. Okay. Yeah, as they are doing that, I have uh, some one or two questions for each of you. And uh, I'm starting with Steve. And uh, Steve, the question for you is that, uh, what is the best way to understand and root out corruption in wildlife trafficking supply chain? Very simple, Vincent, follow the money. The money. 
<laughs> okay. <laughs> I love that. Mm -hmm. um, then uh, perhaps the next question for you, Steve, is... Um, Didn't you just add a question? <laughs> no, I, <laughs> you, you, ask an... <laughs> you are right on point, so we need to give you the next one. <laughs> so the next one, Steve, is... Um, what are the biggest limitations in the implementation of the recommendations you have put forward in your presentation? Uh, for me, there's a number of things and um, Tim touched on it. The, there's a near complete absence of intelligence analysis within the wildlife crime space. We need more intelligence analysts, not investigators, because investigators have a different mindset to analysts. So we need more intelligence analysts. We need more financial investigators. Tim was saying he was a, a what was it? Uh, something account, forensic accountant. That's forensic why. Tim, content, yeah. That's why Tim loved reading that sort of stuff. It would put me to sleep. You need horses for courses. You need to find guys and girls that want to that want to read that sort of stuff. That want to follow the money and and you know and, and you have others that want to go out and chase the crooks. So you know more analysts, more financial uh, investigators, forensic accountants, um, and more support from donors to fund those areas like we see lots and lots of money going in protected areas and rightly so but the idea is to stop the animal being killed in the first place so let's let's take the the fight out of the park let's go to where the targets are where the criminals are let's go to where the networks are along the supply chain and follow that money and to do that you need analysts and you need forensic uh, investigators and you need the funding to do that thank you thank you so much steve uh, and now and I'm sorry, uh, there is one question in the chat from Kate Badwell to Sven. It says, I understand when it comes to sustainable fishing and or other certified processes such as dolphin friendly produce, this is self-certified with little oversight given the fishing happening at the sea. This is clearly open the, to corruption. How can this be addressed and how can consumers rely upon the labeling? All right, I'm stretching my uh, my boundaries here um, because you know, we're not really working in in certification, and I you know, don't want to speak for the Marine Stewardship Council colleagues uh, in here. But what we're seeing um, is um, we're using also technology um, to make that value chain that I mentioned earlier, from the sea to the plate, uh, more transparent. Uh, I think we started with having onboard observers. Um, in, in recent years, I think that is still uh, one of the, the key approaches where you basically place an ideally independent observer on board, monitoring what's been taken out uh, from the ocean, what has been labeled, uh, how is it stored, uh, et cetera. But that has proven to be, A, a very dangerous job. Uh, I think there are a number of organizations who, who uh, look into this, and, uh, and, and B, it is you know, prone to, uh, to corruption. So what we're seeing increasingly is the use of technologies, um, you know, cameras on board monitoring what, what's been doing. Uh, there are even um, solutions already out there that, that can identify what kind of fish it is that's been taken out of the ocean uh, with um, you know, artificial intelligence. And it's, it's basically face recognition for fishes, uh, I'm sure there's a proper word for that, but I, I, I'm not aware of it. So there is technology that um, you know, is is used, but we've seen this with you know vessel monitoring on the ocean that can be that can be tampered with. Um, so uh, I think everything that is getting you know, scalable, and some of these certificates are you know, global, there is the challenge that something does not go go right. Um, uh, so I think it is an important aspect to really understand what is it, what does that label stand for that you're looking at when you're buying a certain, uh, certain fish product. Okay, thank you, Sven. There are some more questions coming in the chat. So Vincent, how do you want to proceed? Do you want me to, to keep uh, reading the questions from the chat or? Yes, yes okay. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, the question from James Williams of Grobis Group. I don't think we have heard much about the potential for predictive analytics and artificial intelligence in combating environmental crimes. Do any of the panel members see a potential role for this? Should I start? Well, let me say 
Yeah, yeah, there is a potential role. But I also have to say, get the basics right first. I mean, half the time we don't actually need predictive analytics. We already, if you actually opened your eyes, you'd see what was going on, yeah. Um, however, having, having, having said that, where countries have got better data and better information, then the ability to actually match irregular behavior on any one of the environmental crimes to outcomes for various individuals is quite possible. For instance, I, you can very quickly say, look, look at government, if you've got the data, you can look at government officials who are entrusted with protecting the environment and identify those who have got a bit more wealth than they should have. Not totally, but you can, it doesn't mean there's a crime there, but you can run, say, payroll against vehicle licensing, against property deeds register, etc. And that will very quickly throw out people who might warrant more look. If you then run that against them having responsibility in areas where there has been some form of loss of wildlife, forest degradation, overfishing, you'll, you'll quickly start to see patterns. But that relies very much on data quality. And I mean, having worked with sort of data analytics in particular for I guess the first electronic analytics I did was in 92, maybe. So it'll be 30 years next year. I, the big challenge to, to this day, pretty much everywhere, is actually data quality and making sure the data, the data is good enough. It's a lot, a lot more difficult to actually get it right than it should do. But in this area, Steve said it earlier, I think, a lot of the very basics are not being done yet even. And I think I would start with the basics first, then get to the data later. Yeah, and if I can just jump in there, Tim, as well, just to follow on. And there's a lot of talk about using AI to identify images that are posted online of wildlife products. Um, and look, that would be great. The, 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 my concern in respect to a, to a shift towards that approach is that you have you know, the, I don't think people understand how small the units are that are investigate wildlife crime. And, you know, they, they have very finite resources. And if you focus those finite resources on the online trade, which is huge, don't get me wrong. But if you were to look at the top five organised crime figures in Vietnam involved in wildlife crime, none of them have a social media presence. None of them are sharing images online. You know, what you will find is law enforcement focuses on those people that are that are um, out there the most and not necessarily those that are engaged in the high risk trafficking that they should be focusing on. So, you know, and there's also for me, you know, you still need, need the analyst. You don't want to take the analyst out of the loop by relying on AI to do all this sort of stuff. So you know, look, there certainly offers us advantages, but I, I think, and, and echoing what Tim just said, we need to get the basics done first. And once we get the basics done, once we have good intel, sorry, good intelligence-led investigations where we put together good cases that go to prosecutors and then go through the courts and to judges and, and, you know, sentencing and conviction, that's what we need. We don't need to create all the, the bells and whistles. We just need a good, solid, robust system that, you know, collects evidence properly, um, documents evidence properly, and it's used properly. There's enough evidence out there. It's not hard to find evidence. What, what's hard is to find people to act that on that evidence. Okay, we are well beyond time. Maybe we can take just one more question before we wrap up um, from Lex and Daka. Most people involved in, in environmental crimes and corruption are those with political connections. And in most cases, their criminal activities are easily ignored or protected by politicians. How do you deal with political interference in the fight against corruption in the environmental sector? How many weeks have we got? <laughs> uh, I mean, any form of corruption may, may go to senior levels 
or maybe alleged to go to senior levels. I mean, it's one step at a time, always one step at a time. Now, the, I won't quote the country, but I remember speaking to an immediate former attorney general in a range state. And I asked him the question, absolutely direct to his face, did you, were you ever instructed by one of your political bosses to actually drop a case? And he said, I wish, I wish it had been the case. It would be easier to explain why so many cases failed. Um, if you get the case right, okay, you do the investigation right, you keep it quiet and you get the case, you do the work right, it is much harder for, a, for someone to actually interfere with the outcome. Right? And if the case is already a screw up, it's very easy for someone to say, God, I don't want this case to go forward. The person who's making the decision on the prosecution hooks up and says, well, it's not gonna go forward anyway. I can, I won't cause myself any grief by chasing the investigator and I'll please the boss. Whereas if the case is strong and solid, it is much harder to push it to one side. Yeah. Now it's not the complete answer, but it's only part of the answer. Um, it's, I mean, we can carry on with different parts of it, but to me, the quality of the basic work that is done sets the tone for everything else. If the basic work is poor, um, then it is so easy for the decision makers to say, just throw this one away. And if someone whispers in their ear, it almost guarantees it goes away. Yeah. I mean, the good work does not guarantee it goes through, but it makes the chance better. Okay. And you cannot, none of us, if there is a concerted will to quash something somewhere, none of us can change that easily. We can build, we can build constituencies against it. We can, we can, we can call about it, and we can get ourselves into trouble for it as well if we're not careful. Because that's the other thing on that question: is there are cases you don't want to, you don't want to pick a fight that you're going to lose. Yeah, not a good plan. Most most bits of life, but you want to, you want to, you've really. Steve said resources are limited. The amount, of, the amount of investigation you've got, the amount of staff you've got, got are limited. Do the job right. For, do the job right. Push the right case. Push the strong case. And if people push back, yeah, fight. But don't fight until you're killed. And I, I mean that last bit. Think about, think about what I just said there. Win what you can win. Thank you very much, Tim. I think if we we can wrap up now the session. So, Vincent, I will give the floor back to you for the closing words. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, our speakers. We want to hear just one message from you. Just give you one minute to wrap up and tell us what you feel should be done. So you just have one minute to wrap up. We are starting with our team. Okay, I wasn't expecting that. Um, <laughs> okay, on the, far, on the forest last side, on the forest last side, remember that very often the corruption happens way back at that strategic level. Very often, you have, to, you have to address things indirectly, but you have to think of those different interlight linking planning levels, and you have to think about strategies at each level. So, and if you don't address the strategic level, you'll get outcomes you don't like that look completely legal because no one has done anything wrong at the tactical or operational level. Okay. I think that's probably enough. I think we're over time a bit already. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. And can we hear from uh, Shivan? Okay. Uh, I'm not going to summarize the, you know, the things on the fisheries. I'm actually building on something that, that Tim said when it comes to the political 
uh, in the uh, interferences. I think a key aspect is really, you know, to, to look for allies. And we're talking, you know, about the government as a monolithic, you know, uh, body, but there are also forces within the government, you know, pros and cons. And if you don't get, you know, far with the Ministry of Fisheries, well, maybe the Ministry of Finance is, is interested in certain aspects and, and can help you drive, drive certain aspects. Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs, uh, we see as, as quite a strong ally, Ministry of Justice, and, you know, also take an international perspective. There are a number of um, foreign embassies in, in most of the countries we are, we are working in. They can become um, allies, uh, academia, et cetera. You know, I think the power of the media has just been shown um, by the release of the Dora papers yesterday. So um, in addition to what, what Tim said, you know, it's also to build your ally network that, that you're not you know, too vulnerable if you're getting into that, into that quest. Thank you, Sivan. Can we hear from Steve, your last comment? Thanks, Vincent. Uh, I'll just quickly actually answer one of the questions that's in the, in the, in the, the queue, and it'll, it'll touch on what my last comment is, and it was, what can analysts do? Well, if you have 50 people in a criminal network, as a law enforcement agency, you can't target 50 people. You need to identify those, out of those 50 people, those individuals that offer the best benefits and pose the greatest risks that you can target and take out to have the greatest impact on the supply chain. And an analyst will do that for you. You know, the analyst will go through all the data, pull together all the connections and linkages. It's not just a, support, it's not just a, a link chart. Everyone's seen the I2 link charts. It's what happens after the link chart. The link chart is just the start. An analyst can pull that all together for you. They can go through the phones. We, we actually did a at the WJC, we did analysis of a phone for a law enforcement agency upon their request. It took two people nine months. Right? It was 110,000 messages on that phone. I don't think people understand the volume. The, 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 uh, this was one terabyte of data that our analysts had to go through. Investigators don't have time to do that. They have cases that keep on coming. You need people behind the scenes that do this. Good data. Tim touched on it. Good data in, good data out. Bad data in, bad data out. Don't reinvent the wheel. Focus on the things that make that we're doing elsewhere really well in law enforcement and apply it to this section. To this section, take out the corrupt actors and level the playing field. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Steve, and thank you very much, our great speakers, for the great insight that you have given us today, in as far as uh, fighting crime wildlife crime and, 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 and environment is concerned and also addressing corruption issues that surrounds it. We very much appreciate your time and thank you so much the participants for creating time to attend this webinar.